Hi, Khan. How are you? I sent you um, his wife's name. Actually. Oh, I saw it. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. And we'll send something out. Thank you. Yes, yes. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to, the, uh, to McNally Hall here at the Cathedral Basilica of Christ the King in the, the Diocese of Hamilton, and for this a very special evening with uh, the Honorable Graydon Nicholas. He has many titles, Chief, Judge, Your Worship, <laughs> I don't know. Your Excellency, I always like calling him Your Excellency, and, uh, and the Honorable, and he's a wonderful man. We're going to begin by saying a prayer, and I think it's on the, you'll find a card on the table, if you, and we'll just, so I'll say the first little part, and then we'll pray the last part together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Who is this that comes forth like the dawn, as beautiful as the moon, as resplendent as the sun. Together, O Blessed Virgin, Our Lady of Guadalupe, intercede for us with your Son, that we who live in this land, indigenous and non-indigenous together, may experience healing and reconciliation on a renewed journey for justice and peace for our children. Mother of the Church, pray for us. So it's my name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Great pleasure to welcome uh, His Honor, uh, Graydon Nicholas, to the Diocese of Hamilton. Uh, I've known Graydon for a long time, actually, many, many years. We've served together on the Catholic Indigenous Council and on the Guadalupe Circle, uh, which is a, an organization that draws together 
the bishops of Canada, some bishops of Canada, representatives of the bishops of Canada, representatives from the indigenous communities and Catholic organizations and religious communities. And we have worked together for many years. So it's a wonderful pleasure for me to welcome him here tonight. He has an illustrious career. He's going to tell you that he failed grade one, but from there on it was to the stars. <laughs> he eventually became the, uh, the Lieutenant Governor of, of New Brunswick and, uh, and uh, has, has really served the country uh, very well in many, many ways. And as an indigenous leader and a man of faith, he has a message for us. He has a, a great devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and tonight, on this feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, we are honored to welcome you here to the uh, Diocese of Hamilton, Graydon, and we look forward to hearing your words of wisdom. Thank you very much for coming. Well, good evening, everyone. And in my language, I say, Dungakalo Gilwa. I just ask how you are. <laughs> so I've got to tell a little bit of a story that Father Doug referred to. Uh, I wasn't going tonight, but he introduced it, so I have to give you a little bit of background. And um, I was born in January 20th, 21st, 1946. And my mother was seven months pregnant at the time. And on January the 6th, she was on her way across a frozen river to catch a train so she could go downtown and buy a birthday gift for my older brother whose birthday was on January 6th. So on the way, uh, and she fell into uh, a pocket, right into the river where the two rivers would meet, sort of a strong current, and she darn near drowned. Thank goodness somebody uh, rescued her, and so two weeks later I was born premature. And... Um, and there's a lot of story to this, but uh, back then they didn't have much, uh, I guess, medical experience about infants who would be born premature. So I was literally, she said, skin and bones. And as it happened, I could not really retain uh, the milk, the fluid that a baby would need. I would absorb it, but then it would all go. And so... Um, many of the women in our community said, it's obvious that God doesn't want him to live. Why don't you just agree as a mother to let him go? So my mother, thank goodness for her determination. Some people say her stubbornness, but we have to say her determination sounds better. She says, no, there's no way I'm going to give him up. I'm going to pray to the mother of Jesus and have her Intervene, intercede. Well, it just so happened there was a new doctor in the area, and so my mother kind of, there wasn't much motor vehicles in the First Nation where I'm from. There was a guy working in the First Nation, and she went up to him and says, I want you to take me downtown to the doctor's office. I have to take my baby there. She said, well, I can't get time off work. I don't care. I'm telling you, take me down. This was my mom, you know, so... She's a good advocate for me. And <laughs> so sure enough, the guy took me downtown, and this new doctor was there and examined me, and what's this sight, you know? So, and said, maybe the only thing that you can do uh, to mix the um, milk would be to use, uh, use uh, some uh, broth from beef barley soup because of its salt content. So sure enough, they mixed the milk with the broth from beef, barley, soup, and I started to retain liquid and fluid. So that's what helped me to survive. And so even today as I walk into a restaurant when I smell beef, barley, soup, <laughs> I've got to have a bowl of soap here, you know, there's no doubt about that. And uh, so anyway, that was the trauma of my particular birth, and, and thank goodness the prayers were answered by the mother of Jesus, of course, and uh, 
So uh, the other story is about what I shared this afternoon with the other group. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Or Okay. And um, when I started grade one, uh, here's what happened the night before. Because uh, my older brothers and sisters were, had gone to school, and I'm, I was toward the bottom of the, of the ten children, twelve children that my mom and dad had. So, so here's what they told me. Zebo no gilam squash kade na jiwiri gakims, na jiwiri gakims seen am squashes knusta wag bilwata wati did, na gach kta bachi ma tur gaki gamit kep gal kta lewis, a bachi ma kep gal lewis in kta si diamant lewis now. So what did I just say? The night before, my brothers and sisters said, "Tomorrow, for the very first time, you're going to go to school, and you're going to hear a different language." And the teacher who is there is going to ask you, what is your name? So when she asks you what your name is, you tell her my name is. That's the first time that night before school I found out my name was Graydon. Because we all have nicknames. You're either a brother of somebody or younger brother or your mother or father. All the, you're a relative of somebody in our First Nation community. So nobody ever called me Graydon. I didn't know my name was Graydon, actually. So, but, so sure enough, next morning, I go to school, and any teachers here? Teachers know, well, you don't have to put, oh, hey, it's all good, okay. Well, teach, teachers know, you know, they've got that little information. They know the names of everybody. Even before they ask you your name, they know. They just want to know if you can respond. So sure enough, the teacher asked me, what is your name? Now, I had that drilled in my mind, what is your name, in English that night before, so I heard about it, and I, Graydon, what is your last name? I had no clue. <laughs> I, I mean, nobody ever talked about last name or surname, whatever the fancy stuff is, right? So I just shrugged my shoulders like this, and I, had, I didn't know. I didn't know what, even, what last name was. I, knew, I didn't know I had a last name. So anyway... Um, Sitting next to me was my cousin, a real good friend. And um, so the teacher asked him, what is your name? So he kind of nudged me because, you know, seats are kind of close to those little seats you've got. And he said, Gabriel Lewis, what's my name? So I said, Chucky. So Chucky tells the nun. And nobody on that list has a name called Chucky, right? You'd think they'd be short for Charles or something. But there was no Charles either. And she says, no, you can't be Chucky. You must be somebody else. And, and I had no idea either. It's a good friend. So finally, um, she went through the list. She said, oh, you must be Martin. That's a nice name for him, you know. I never knew that. But she says, Martin, Martin. He kept saying Martin, Martin. Get used to his name. Then the teacher asked him, well, what's your last name? Again, he asked me, Gekwinel Lewis, and I told him, I had no idea. So, um, so anyway, he got so frustrated, the teacher kept drilling him, what's your last name, what's your last name, Martin, come on, tell me your last name. And finally he says, oh, Martin, 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 the hell with it. Now, <laughs> when you say that, in a, and the teacher is a nun, believe me, he and I were not... We're in the bad, bad side of this teacher. And so we had to stay in after school. And back then they had chalkboards. So I said, okay, clean the chalkboard. We had to clean all the chalkboards and clean the floor and all this stuff. And so I got home probably, school went to 3.30. So I got home about quarter after 4, maybe 4.30. And my mother says, where have you been? What have you been doing? I said, well, I stayed behind. The teacher needed help. So I helped her. <laughs> Who else was there? So I told her, my cousin, Chucky, was there. And he says, well, how did it go? I said, well, she asked me what my name was, and I answered her. But she asked me another question, and I don't know what the answer was, so I couldn't answer her. And I said, I tried to help my Chucky, but we both got in trouble. And she, so she went down to the convent where the nuns were. And she asked the nun, what did my son do that you had to keep him in after school to clean all his, you know, that was what was done back then for punishment. So she said, well, he did not know his last name. My mother says, how do you expect 
somebody who was five years old to know his last name. We've never told him his last name. So he doesn't even know such a name exists. Now, is that the only reason why you punished him? Yes, you said, well, you better not do it again. So that's why, like I said, you know, my mother was a good ally to have, a good advocate. And uh, <laughs> so uh, as interesting as that was, uh, you know, we all know what happens at the end of school, right, in June? Get these nice little report cards. And I got my card, and I got home, and gave it to my mom. I said, here, mom, teacher wants me to give this to you. So she opened it and said, oh, no. I said, oh, what happened? She says, you failed grade one. I said, I did? How come? She says, according to this, it said you don't know how to read. So I would know certain words, but I couldn't read them in a line. Something as simple as C spot run, I knew the word C, but I just couldn't read it. So I failed grade one because of that. And uh, so another year of grade one in the fall, and my cousin Martin was in grade two. He passed. So he, he, uh, he said, I'll help you to learn how to read. The teacher's too busy anyway, and you'll do okay. So I said, whoa, thank goodness, Chucky came through. So that's the background, you see. So you start out your career that I'm doing now uh, almost like a failure because that's what he was. And throughout that whole summer, with a name like Great, and he said, Great, did you grade? Of course, the answer was no. And so I was ridiculed in my own community. You know, hey, stupid. Hey, how come you can't read this? You know, there were all, and it really, I mean, you, you imagine now as a, six, as a six-year-old child, you've got all that stuff being said about you, right? So uh, I asked my mother, I said, how come they're making fun of me? They're calling me stupid, they can't read, and all this stuff. So my mother, again, being the advocate that she is, she says, don't you worry. They're the ones who are going to be stupid. You watch it. You're smarter than they think you are. You'll do all right. So never mind what they're doing. So my mom says, never mind. I never mind. So that was the pattern in my own life, you know. So at the very beginning, my introduction to this fantastic educational system that's there. So how do I get to our Lady Guadalupe? <laughs> Anyway, so as Bishop Doug indicated, in 1998, right after the Sacred Assembly in Ottawa, which was held between indigenous elders, indigenous leaders, governmental leaders, and the representatives of our Catholic faith, and a lot of other churches as well, gathered in, uh, well, back, back then it was called Hall, Quebec. Gatineau is what it's called now. So I, the bishop... From our diocese, uh, and uh, by then I was, I was a provincial court judge. So I went to Mass on a Saturday night, confirmation. I said, oh, gee, this is going to be a long night. So, so after Mass, he said, I want to see him. And I said, uh-oh, he must have heard me. But, <laughs> and he said, look, he says, I, I want you to go to uh, represent our diocese in Hull uh, at a major uh, thing, sacred assembly. I said, what's sacred assembly? I had never heard of it. Of course, I had no reason to know, right? He says, well, you go up there. I think you'll be the best representative for our diocese. And make sure when you go there, you'll get a sale price for an airline ticket and make sure the hotel you stay in is, gives you a good discount. That was our bishop. I won't name the bishop. But um, so, and, when I, and, and you're busy, of course. So I called the Air Canada next morning. And I said, uh, is there a seat sale from Fredericton to Ottawa? No. I said, oh, okay, when's it coming up? Well, not until next month. I, he said, well, I said, I'm trying to get, I'm supposed to go to a big meeting in Ottawa, and, I, I, and I'm going like this, you know, trying to find a seat for me. Oh, he says, hey, wait a minute now. There is a seat available. Just flashed. There's a seat available. It's on sale. You can leave on a sort of like a, what was it, I think, on a Thursday night, and come back on Sunday. I said, okay, I'll take it. And uh, could you also get me a hotel? <laughs> So I stayed at this hotel, it was good. Anyway, so I went there, it was amazing what happened, but uh, this was the beginning of the discussion on what reconciliation would have been, what it was at stake as reconciliation because a lot of other things that happened in this country with indigenous people and our church and governments. 
And I learned a lot from that. But so in 1998, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops decided to form an uh, Aboriginal Council that Bishop Doug and I were both on. So when you're in meetings with bishops and other indigenous people and faith, people of our faith, we, we started to meet. We met, we had about maybe, I think about five indigenous representatives, if I recall. Doug, I'm sorry, Doug, Bishop Doug. I have a tendency just to call him Doug because we're good friends, you know. So I hope I don't offend anybody if I call your <laughs> bishop <laughs> Doug. So that's my name. That's your name, okay, all right. <laughs> and his parents used to live in New Brunswick, so that's even better. But uh, anyway, so I, uh, so we said, okay, in that, in that discussions we had as indigenous people, we said, how can we get convinced the bishops that they should accept part of our spirituality, part of the way we pray, part of the way we live? And so it took a while, but however, uh, we convinced enough of them to say, okay, could we have one day in the whole liturgical year, in the whole calendar year, dedicated to First Nations, indigenous people in this country? Well, we'll try it out for an experiment, and we did. For those of us who were from different dioceses, we promoted it, of course, with friends we had of particular priests that I knew. And uh, so I promoted it, and it was done. And it was almost like a trial basis. So by the time 2004 came along, I had, uh, I had to resign because I was the president of another organization called Christian Life Communities, based in Guelph, Ontario. So I had to get off the particular. But... It just so happened, you know, funny how, how the Lord works in mysterious ways. And the one who replaced me was an indigenous uh, woman who was a nun uh, uh, of St. Martha's. In, she was a Mi'kmaq from Cape Breton. So she had heart problems in the uh, winter of 2005. So she calls me up and says, Graydon, yeah, how are you doing, sister? Good. Can you represent me at the meeting in Ottawa? I said, well, when is it? It's coming up in two weeks' time. I said, oh, how come? What happened? Oh, I got to go to the hospital, get an open-heart surgery. I said, well, that's a good excuse. <laughs> I said, I'll see if I can go. I'd have to leave on a Thursday, be thinking of my court schedule and all this stuff. And so, so sure enough, I said, okay, I'll go. I said, what's happening anyway? She says, oh, the usual. I said, well, how's it coming about this National Day of Prayer? I haven't heard anything more. She said, well, you'll find out all about it when you get there. So anyway, I went there, and when I got there, of course, one of the questions I asked is, what's happening on this National Day of Prayer? So the fall before, in 2004, the Canadian Conference Catholic Bishop agreed that December the 12th of every liturgical year would be designated as the National Day of Prayer for now in solidarity with Indigenous people. And the day that was selected was the Feast of, of Our Lady Guadalupe. So because I asked the question, they said, okay, why don't you write something up to explain to the public what this is all about. And so it, it's, it can't be any more than 500 words. And you know that little missalette you get, uh, I think it's called the Daily Missalette. Living, Li Living with Christ. Okay, there you go. Living with Christ. I said, okay. So you start drafting, doing research on Our Lady Guadalupe. And I was kind of fascinated at everything I was reading. I said, wow, this is something. So anyway, I, I had to have three editorials <laughs> because one was 700 words, that's too much. Pared it down to 600, that's still too much. So you only have 500 words to put on a sheet of paper. That's how they do it. And they had to have it by mid-May. I said, wow, this is something. So anyway, I finally got it done, and it appeared in the issue of the December uh, 2005, uh, Living with Christ. So I just saw it, and then it just so happened the end, in the middle of January, because I was a provincial court judge, I was transferred uh, from an area into the city of Fredkin, where I live. So I had heard that there was a missionary image of our Lady Guadalupe that was in New Brunswick. And I said, where is it? Oh, there's one up in uh, Tracady, where Tracady is primarily an Acadian area, not far from the Miramichi. So uh, I called and left the message with the priest, but the, my message was in English, and his was French. So I didn't know what he told me. He probably didn't know what I said. 
so anyway, I missed that opportunity. And so I was going, my wife and I, she works in Justice Built as well. And we went to Mass sort of like on a next week about, say, I'll just say Wednesday. It wasn't a weekday. So a friend of mine who worked with the New Brunswick Right to Life, uh, and they have a house right in Fredericton, said, Graydon, I heard you're trying to find out about Our Lady Guadalupe. I said, yeah, I do. I said, I kind of missed it when I had a chance to go up to Tracadie. He says, well, I've got the missionary image in my office. I said, you do? Wow, I was all excited. So my wife and I went there uh, after Mass, and we saw the missionary image of Our Lady Guadalupe. <sighs> well, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I said, wow. You know, when you write about something and you've never seen it, until you see it, it's an incredible, very, very... Uh, it was a very emotional moment for, for me and for my wife, too. So we... Anyway, we... We said a decade of the rosary, and I said, i got to go back to work. <laughs> the court opens at 1 o'clock, so... And then he told me, he says, would you like to have the missionary image of Our Lady Guadalupe from Saturday afternoon at noon until uh, noon on Sunday? And I said, yes. I and he says, it's up to you where you want to take it. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with New Brunswick, but I'll just give you a little bit. Fredericton is the capital city where I lived. About, well, we go by a number of minutes to get to a spot. 40 minutes up is Nakwe. And it's a, it's, a, it's a mill that's in there, a lot of people. And I, I had a prayer group going on in there. So I called the priest that I knew, and I said, is it okay if I bring the missionary image of Early Guadalupe? Because their mass was at 4 o'clock till 5. I said, I'll be there at 5 o'clock, and then I'll speak about Our Lady Guadalupe there. The next one was about another 20 miles away to a First Nation community. I'd be there. I said, okay, nap week, half an hour. I should be there by 6 o'clock. It's only that short time. And I said, um, and then I called my brother up in my own community an hour away from there. And I said, could you gather some people I'd like to speak about? Our Lady Guadalupe. Okay. Everybody said, okay, okay, okay. Well, when I got to Nakowick, the priest decided to have no homily. And so people are sitting in the pew. Kids are getting hungry and are coming in late. You know, <laughs> and I set the image up and, and, I, and I'll share with you what, I, what I'm going to share with you later. But just to show you, people were coming from all over because they said, well, graydon has got the picture of the mother of Jesus. We better go there. So people from other surrounding areas came there. Well, what happened is people got so caught up in the story, I didn't get out of there till 10 to 6. I said, I got to go up river. So I got that. When I got, by the time I got to St. Woodstock First Nation, it was only 20 minutes away, it was 6.30. Now, bingo starts on a First Nation community <laughs> at 7 o'clock. So I said, uh-oh, this better be a quick, quick, quick presentation. So I set it up in the gymnasium in the community, and I went through that. But people were kind of fascinated by everything. And uh, so I said, okay, uh, but we were late there. I didn't get to my community. I was supposed to be there at 8. I didn't get there till 9 o'clock that night. And there was a wake that night. There was a casino night. So the only ones who were there was about 12 of us. My brother, my sister, my uncle, <laughs> my good friend. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I made the presentation. I had to drive back two hours back to Fredericton. My wife happened to be away in St. John with her parents. But 8 o'clock, I had to be at another First Nation community. And I said, because I had to be at this church at 9 o'clock in Fredericton. So thank goodness I got up early, went. And then it, on a First Nation community, for those of you who are familiar with First Nation community, they're sort of like bungalows, the houses, when you go in there. And it's packed. So my elder, who I was close to, I said, yes, Come here, Graydon. Come here. I said, I'll be there 10 to, 10 to 8, because I, I have to leave by 8.30. Well, you'll never believe it. With his children, his grandchildren, great-grandchildren, there were 45 people jam-packed in a small living room. So I told the story. And then what happens in the indigenous communities is 15 minutes later, somebody else comes. So you have to retell the story. And go like this. <laughs> and he went, gee, I'm looking at my watch. I said, holy God, 8.30, quarter to nine. I said, 
I said, Tendon, I got to go. My friend who's a priest down there, he's going to really get mad at me because it's only a 15-minute drive. Okay, we'll let you go. I said, whoa, whoop did he do So I go to Franklin, and there was a new speed limit going down. I was grateful of that. And there were no police on the road. So I get to the, to, the, to the particular church I was going to where my friend was a parish priest. And I went to back of the church and I said, I'm late. I'll speak at the end. No, I want you to speak right now. The church is full because there's kids going to Sunday school. He says, so go set it up front right off the bat. So when I was leaving to go set it up, and it's kind of heavy. So I had, there was this guy walking in there and his wife and must be a grandchild. I said, could you help me carry this in? And his wife said, help him. I said, he said, we might be late for me. I said, no, no, they're going to wait for us. Don't worry. <laughs> so we walk in on the side of the, and the church is full. And everybody's looking at us, and this guy's embarrassed. But we set it up, and we went through the thing so I could make sure that I could take it at noon to another church. So that's the background of this. Now, people got all excited. And Bishop uh, Favor McDonald was our diocesan bishop. I, I shared that with him. Brayden, that's incredible. That's amazing. Can you bring the image to New Brunswick again this summer to the shrine of Skiff Lake that we have? I said, geez, I don't know. I didn't even bring it here. I'm not sure who to contact. So I called the people in Edmonton. I said, this is Graydon Nichols. Graydon who? Judge Graydon Nichols? Judge who? <laughs> didn't impress them who I was. And I said, uh, the bishop of our diocese wants me to see if I can bring the uh, missionary image of our league Guadalupe based in Edmonton to New Brunswick this summer. So they said, uh, who are you again? What's the name of the bishop? <laughs> So Bishop McDonald actually had to contact them, the Archbishop in, uh, in Edmonton, to say, well, he's not such a bad guy, but you can trust him with it. So that's what began an annual summer time for me, going to talk to people like yourselves I'm going to share with you. I just want to give you that background, because sometimes people say, well, why are you doing that? And I end up being called Our Lady's chauffeur, by the way, you know. <laughs> it's a fantastic woman to drive with. She doesn't give any directions. You get there on time, you know, and it's a good prayerful time. I apologize to the women. I shouldn't say that. My wife always says, you shouldn't say that, Graydon. That's, I say, well, but it's true for, in my case, may not be true for others. So what happened? Okay, I'll go to that. Oh, what happened to the image? I told me I lost it. I hope I didn't. Yeah. I better start talking. Uh, where's my, where's my, uh, I need a technician here, I think. Okay, here we go. So as you can see here, this beautiful, beautiful copy of the actual image of Our Lady Guadalupe as she appeared on the morning of December the 12th, 1531. I have this at home so I can take it down and put it up again as I go. So what's significant about that? Well, about 1520, after the Spaniards came in that part of the Americas, it only took them one year to conquer the powerful Aztecs tribe that were there. And so after that was done, and the military, uh, they said, OK, do you, let's say, do you want to become Catholic? Well, they didn't know what, who Catholic was, what that was all about. Well, you know, you'll, you'll know about Jesus. And so the missionaries came as well, but nobody would. But the way the Aztecs people said, if the soldiers are as brutal as they are, geez, maybe their God's just as bad. You know, they could not see the peacefulness of who Jesus was because that was not being portrayed by the people who were followers of Jesus Christ at that time. So it was a big struggle. I have a tendency to move around, by the way, just to let you know. And so a man by the name Juan Diego... Juan Diego actually had two wives. That was their culture. And he had three children with one woman and two, one with another. And he was married. One of his wives was his first cousin, Maria, who was the daughter of his uncle, Juan Bernardino. So Juan Diego and his two wives and their children all lived with, with his uncle, Juan Bernardino, outside of Mexico City. So, and he and his wife actually made a living out of building... Uh, making, uh, fabricating, I'm not sure, weaving clothing, I think. And in that area of Mexico, if any of you have seen the cactus, you see the sharp needles in there, right? 
You pull that needle out, there's yarn, there's thread, there's fiber. So it was this fiber that they used to make clothing. One of them would be what they call a tilma. I called, if, if rain poncho was made out of cloth, it would be like a rain poncho. No hood, but that kind to protect you from the, from the uh, coldness, as well as also symbolism in their own culture of a wedding garment. When you joined the uh, man and the woman together, this tilma was used as sort of like a sign that they were united together for life, that kind of a thing. So this is how they made their living, and they continued. And the indigenous people were treated really, really bad. Whatever culture they had and places of worship, they were destroyed. And uh, so in 1525, interestingly enough, Juan Diego and his uncle and his two wives and their children all became Catholic. They were baptized. At that moment of baptism, as we know, you can't have two wives. <laughs> so he had to let one of the women go so she could be married to, happened to be his brother. And then he said, I want to continue to be married to Maria, my, my, my first cousin. And they were allowed to do that, but they could not have any marital relations. This, is, this, this was one of the conditions that the priests had. And so they were fine with that, and they continued to live. And then in, uh, in 1528, there was a new Franciscan bishop that was sent from Spain. His name was Juan Samaguera. This is a story about the three Juans. And so as soon as the bishop came there, he realized, how am I going to convince these indigenous people to become followers of Jesus? He saw how brutal the soldiers were and the military, how they made the people into slaves because they didn't bring their own labor. So who's going to do all the work for you? It had to be the indigenous people. So they were made into slaves, do hard work, hard labor, and uh, even the women were forced to work. And, uh, so, and then the, the uh, Spanish started to father Indian children from the, from the indigenous women that were living in the area. And of course, these children, the Spaniards did not want to be responsible for, and the, in the community they were well accepted, but not fully because of the... Uh, Spanish part of their, of their being. But there were still children being raised by the Aztecs. So, and, but he, so he prayed to Our Lady, give me help, help me so I can convert more of these people. So, 1529, uh, Juan Diego's wife died. But he continued to live with his, uh, with his uncle and children. And he, once he became Catholic, he decided to go to Mass as much as he could to the center of the city. And from where his uncle lived to the center of the city, it's about 18 kilometers. Boy, that had to be a dedicated Catholic to walk 18 kilometers to go to Mass, you know. But that's what he did. And so he would pass by this thing called Topeak Hill, and from there to where the church was, about another four kilometers to walk. So he would do that daily if there was church. So on the morning of December the 9th, and December the 9th happened to be on a Saturday morning, he left his uncle's place, walked, and when he got to this area called Topeak Hill, he heard birds singing. Birds, I mean, if he were me, I'd say he was nosy, but for him he was curious. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he went up, walked up toward the hill, and the beautiful, beautiful music that the birds were singing. And uh, so finally, uh, he's drawn up, he went up, and all of a sudden, he hears somebody say, Juan Diego, dear Juan Diego, how are you? And he's, you know, and then he finally he met this woman. And, she's, and he kind of, she's all very he's indigenous and spoke his language, and he wasn't sure who she was. And she says, I am the mother of the true God, Teol and Deus. Teol in his language as God, Jesus, and Deus as God in Spanish. And he, you know, he, I mean, he probably heard about who Mother of God was, who Mother of Jesus was from his instructions. But why me? She says, well, I, I hear your people crying. I want a little church or chapel built where the people can come and pray, and I will comfort them and take care of them. And, but in order for that to happen, I need you to go talk to the bishop 
and convince him that he should build a church here. Juan Diego thought about, yeah, okay, why not? <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, didn't say why not. I'm exaggerating here, <laughs> but but so he walks into where the bishop's palace is, and people working for the bishop are kind of reluctant to let him go in. But eventually, he saw the bishop and said, "Guess what? This morning, I met Mary, the mother of the true God, Teo and Deus." <laughs> Can he, I'm not saying Father Doug here is, he'd probably be stunned if I told him the same thing. Guess what? This morning, but. The bishop says, well, that can't be. Why would Mary, the mother of God, appear to you? You're Indian. You're not even a full Catholic yet. And wouldn't believe him. So Juan Diego got very disappointed. On the way back home, the Blessed Mother met him again. And said, how did it go? Well, she probably knew what happened anyway. I mean, after all, I know Blessed Mother. And test him out. <laughs> and he says, well, it didn't go good. The bishop listened to me, but he doesn't believe me. And there's no way I don't think he's going to build a chapel, church. Well, I want you to do the same thing. And he says, well, and this is kind of an interesting thing that happens in this dialogue that takes place. And Juan Diego says, well, you know, Blessed Mother, why don't you send somebody more important, somebody who's liked in the community. I bet the bishop will listen to that person, and they'll, in fact, do what you asked them to do. Blessed Mother said, well, yes, I could do that, and I'm sure I could find people who would do that. However, I want you to do it. Will you be my messenger, be my ambassador? Mondiga says, well, yeah, okay, I'll try again tomorrow. So December 10th is a Sunday. Again, he goes to see the bishop after Mass and tells him, well, guess what? <laughs> On the way back, I met the Blessed Mother again with the same message, and he still wants you to build a church. And same story, two days in a row. So finally the bishop says, well, if it's true what you're telling me, if it in fact is the Mother of God who spoke to you, then have her give me a sign. Otherwise, don't bother with me. I got other important things to do. So he left. And when he left, the bishop asked his people, follow this guy and find out if it's true what he's saying. So they followed him, but they lost him. Juan Diego went back to his uncle's place. These two went back, tell the bishop, don't believe Juan Diego. He's a troublemaker. Don't believe him. He's making this stuff up because they couldn't see anything. So... Juan Diego goes to his uncle, and his uncle was severely ill overnight. On the morning of the 11th, he was really bad. And they said, well, I think he's going to die. So on the evening, uh, Juan, Juan Diego's uncle, Juan, Juan Bernardino, says, um, could you go to the city and find me a priest so the priest can pray over me? So when I die, I can go to heaven and join our ancestors. I mean, that's what they were being taught, right? So Juan Diego says, okay, I'll get up. So early in the morning, again, he gets up, works toward the city. But this time, he says, there's no way I'm going to go on this side to hell. I don't have time. I'm going to go on the other side. Well, you can't fool Mary. So, <laughs> so she comes walking down on that side of the hill and says, what's, what's going on? How come? Why are, you, why are you in such a hurry for? Juan Diego, kind of embarrassed, says, well, look at that. How was your night? And she tells him, well, my uncle is seriously ill and have to go find a priest. I don't have time to go see the bishop. And she says, what is it I told you the other day that I would look after things? You know, and if you want to look at your prayer card, the one that was passed out to you, everybody's got one, flip it around and see the words in the back. Did you get a card? Here. I'll get another one over here. Thank you. So did you get one then? Okay, I'll get you one too. I got a bunch here, so. Anybody else need a card? Okay, I'll get, okay, here you go. Oh, okay, they're over there. Anybody else? I'll give more to you. Yeah, yeah. I need one first though. But <laughs> okay, I'll wait. I'll wait till you all get a card.
So did everybody have a card? No, nice card. And uh, anyway, here's what she said. At that time, after Juan Diego had told her that his uncle was seriously ill. Listen, my son, to what I tell you now. Do not be troubled nor disturbed by anything. Do not fear illness nor any other distressing occurrence, dis distressing occurrence nor pain. Am I not your mother? Am I not life and health? And if I not placed you on my lap and made you my responsibility, do you need anything else? So after she spoke those words to him, he said, your uncle's gonna be okay, don't worry. Now the bishop is asking for a sign. I want you to go up on that hill and there are all kinds of beautiful flowers growing on that hill. I want you to go up there, pick every one of them, bring them down to me, and I'll rearrange them, and you take them to the bishop. So one day he goes on top of the Bay Hill, and sure enough, there are all kinds of beautiful flowers growing there, roses. They're not supposed to grow in the wintertime in Mexico City, that's because it's a mile high above sea level, and the same thing would be here. You wouldn't expect roses to grow out here. And so he did. He picked every one of them, brought them down, and as I said, he was wearing this telma that his wife had, had made for him. So he covered them up like this, you know, and she arranged the flowers. He says, okay, now go to see the bishop and let, tell him this is the sign he's looking for. So he goes four kilometers to where the bishop lives, and the people outside don't really want to let him go see the bishop because they know he's a troublemaker, and they make him wait a long time, and one of them sees a flower sticking out. So he goes to see, and the flower disappeared. And this happened two more times. They kind of got spooked out when the bishop said, you better see this guy, he's got something for you. So sure enough, the bishop tells, come on in, and, and Juan Diego gives the same story, and he says, you know, you're asking for a sign. So the Blessed Mother, the mother of Jesus, Teo, Deus, true God, told me to give you these flowers. And he opens up his telma, and as those flowers fell, that's what a, oh, look at your card. There it is. That's what appeared on his telma, just like that. Miraculously, that's what happened. So the bishop realized that Juan Diego was not making stuff up. And all of a sudden, just like that, Juan Diego from being a nobody to a somebody. So the bishop cried when he saw this. And when he saw, he said, Juan Diego, take out your telma. I'm going to put that up in my prayer space. And now because you're somebody, you're going to live with me where I live. You're too important a person. And I will agree to build the chapel that she asked for. Incredible story, right? True, except it's not an embellishment a little bit here and there. So when I first heard that story, I said, wow, it's incredible. The Blessed Mother spoke an indigenous language. Her complexion is that of an indigenous woman, but the complexion is that of those children who were fathered by Spaniards and mother, and, and of course the mother was indigenous. So she elevated then the beauty and importance of these children. And so, and sure enough, next day, Juan Diego said, I better go find out how my uncle, I'm not sure if he's alive or dead. So, Juan Diego, uh, so the bishop says, hey, wait a minute now, you're not going to go alone, my people are going to go with you. So they went. And they took that telma with them to where, walked 18 kilometers, can you imagine that? And they went to see the uncle, and the uncle, his eyes open, he says, that's the same woman who came to speak to me yesterday morning and told me I'm okay, I'm well. In fact, she told me her name is Our Lady of Guadalupe. It was to the elder then that the name Guadalupe comes in, who was his uncle. And Juan Diego himself, he was 57 years old at the time when all this happened. So again, all of a sudden, wow, a second miracle happened. Well, they didn't know about the second one, but it happened before. He was well. And Juan Diego then began to leave look after this chapel where the image was. Now what's so significant for indigenous people? If I had the actual image here, you'd see it better. But I don't think I can magnify, where's my assistant? I don't think I can magnify that, can I? We tried. Anyway, around her, first of all, her eyes are open. And uh, the thing is, 
and she, her, she has her hands in prayer like this, and you can see the, uh, can you make that larger? Wow. Okay, just can you bring it down? Uh-oh. Can you? You can't, can you? Okay, good. All right. If you, can you make just a little larger then? How did you do that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Down a little bit. No, yeah, blow, blow it up a little bit more. Right around her neck. No, you see that? You see on her neck, there's a cross. You see that? There's a cross. And that kind of cross that some of the Spaniards had, the indigenous people didn't like it because it was oppression. When they saw it on her, with, and her eyes are open, you can see that. Her, her face is like this in a prayerful space. So they said, wow, that's amazing. And the way her hair is parted, if your hair was parted in indigenous area, that means you were a virgin. But around her, where's my assistant? Oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Okay, can you go down a little bit more to the center? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Her hands and where that belt is. Okay, right there. All right. Now, this little dark belt that you have around her, that meant you were pregnant with child. And, of course, the season of Advent, we know we celebrate the maternity of Mary because Jesus was going to be born, right? And can you just lower that a little bit more, too? Okay, just a minute. See, there's a four-petal flower right here. Oh, just a minute. Uh, right here. Can you get that four-petal? This one? Can you get that blown up? This is what's called a four-petal flower, uh, which signifies, see that? That four-petal that petal flower signified that Jesus was in the womb of the Blessed Mother. So in the culture of Juan Diego, you can see then how the clothing she wore signified his culture. And then these represent different things as well. Okay, if you can just go up a little bit again, please, if you don't mind. I like this guy, assistant. Okay. <laughs> you, see those, you see those stars that are on the blue part of the mantle? They signify the constellation of the stars that were in the sky and the time. Now, they, these people can time this very well. This aberration took place at 6.45 a.m. Mexico time. And so that, that's when, and you'll see, if you just go in the big thing again, just go back to the original. Okay. You can see, you see the rays here? The, all these rays? Right there? The... Aztecs believed in the god of the sun and the god of the moon. So in order to replace the gods of the sun and the moon, that's why she said, I am the mother of the true god, Jesus. That's the message there. And so she's blocking off the sun. And here, this is a crescent moon. So her feet are on the moon to say, that's not a god, and they're blocking off the sun all of a sudden the focus is on the child that she's carrying inside her womb, who is Jesus. So that's, for in the culture of Juan Diego, all this, wow, made a whole lot of sense. And you'll see at the very bottom here, there's an angel. See? Angel holding her up. And I always tell people, and this is, I, when, whenever I go speak to a group and I got this thing right here set up, I said, if you ever want to see what the mother of Jesus looks like or what an angel looks like, we don't have to die. There it is. And that is the only face of the Blessed Mother in the whole wide world. You know, we know she's appeared in Fatima, Lourdes, and all of these other places, but she's never really left behind for everybody what she looked like. And in another, what, nine years, it's going to be 500 years old, this tilma. It's still there in this beautiful basilica at, 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 um, uh, in Mexico City. And you'll notice that the wings on that angel, they're called eagle wings. Juan Diego, in his culture, was called eagle speaker because that's the way he was brought up by his grandparents, to be wise. and He didn't believe in fighting. He didn't believe in human sacrifices. And he was kind of ostracized by his own family for that. So you can see the significance then of all this appearing on 
Our Lady of Guadalupe. So when I first, I said, wow, I mean, I'm reading this for the first time, and then when I saw it, that's why I wept when the first time I saw the actual copy of it. I couldn't believe it. So I said, okay, I've got to go around, spread this message to as many as I can. And I have been doing that since 2006 until COVID came along. But these cards that you have, I had smaller ones. And you know what's interesting is when you don't do this kind of work, I call up my friend who was an undertaker. I said, uh, oh, Graydon, how are you doing? Good. How about you? How's it going? Not too bad. What can I do to help you? Well, when an undertaker asks you that, you know what the answer is. So I said, well, I'd like to have a prayer card made. I said, prayer card? He says, who died? I said, nobody died. I said, well, why do you want a prayer card? So I told him the story. And I said, I'd like to get a card made like this. He says, oh, we don't print them here. You've got to go to a printing company. I said, do you, could you recommend one? And they did. So I started making these small little cards before I went on that quick visit that I talked to you about earlier that Saturday. So with those cards and these cards, I've probably distributed close to 35, no, I'm exaggerating, 18,000 cards like this. And, and I, I said, I want to get the message of Our Lady to as many people as possible because it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And as remarkable as what I'm telling you here, and there is, there is a, actually a text that I can send to Bishop Doug, and he can make it available to you. It's called Nikon, Nikon Mapua, in which is actually what I'm telling you here is part of that story. But as you do more research, you get more background information. In the span of 10 years, from 1531 to 1541, this is incredible, there were 9 million conversions into the Catholic faith by the Mexican tribes. Nine million. That works about almost, one time I had a calculator, it works out to about 1,700 a day for every day of the week for, for 10 years. That's an astounding number of baptisms. But this is how they were so, because they found out that Jesus sent his mother to come and bring them comfort in the midst of all that oppression, in the midst of all that violence, in the midst of how those children were born. And so... I'm not sure if I'm going to live long enough to 2031. I hope I am, but I don't know. But I hope somebody here does. So that'll be the 500th year. And that cloth, that tilma that came from these cactus, was only supposed to be good for what? 12 years? You can't make clothing and last, have them last forever. You're not going to make any money. Who are you going to feed? But that is, the original is still in the basilica at Mexico City. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. But the next thing I want to share with you, and I'll take a little bit of break here, have you get Q&A. When I went around in 2006, my wife took seriously on that long weekend in May. And we were getting ready because our first grandchild was going to be born in Arizona. And you know, by the time I, I was, what, I was uh, 60 years old at the time, my wife would have been, I'll give her a benefit of the doubt, 57. But, and then we wanted to see our first grandchild. She took sick, we couldn't go. And so the, the medical people could not determine the extent of her, uh, of her injury, abdominal injury. And they said, well, you have to have light time. You can't travel, you can't travel. And I said, you can't go biking, you can't do this, you can't do that, all that stuff. So we were, of course, very discouraged. But anyway, the Tilma did come in, in July to our house from Edmonton. And I would go around speaking to people, just myself. And so I shared that with another person from St. John, New Brunswick. And she took it one side of the province, and I took it another and she happened to be on the Miramichi side, which is on the eastern part of the province of New Brunswick. And our prayer group was there. And then she invited the people to come and say a little prayer for somebody or for yourself or for whatever the intention would be. So my wife went up there. And I was up in the choir loft. And I would ask people, would you like a uh, picture taken of you touching the tilma? 
yes. So I'd go up and get my camera, you know. <laughs> so when my wife went up, I, I saw her praying, and then I saw her turn around. And the moment she turned around, I could see on her face an expression, something happened to her. So I went down, and I said, what happened to you? She said, what do you mean? I said, your face changed completely when you left the image and you came down. She said, I don't know, just something happened. I don't know what it is. Well, so we went to have lunch with our prayer group, and this woman said, my wife's name is Beth. Beth, they said, how are you doing with that abdominal obtrusion that you have? You know, they were bleeding these cysts on her liver. And uh, so, very painful. And Beth says, well, you know, this morning when I took a shower, oh, oh I think I'm caught up here. Anyway, she said, uh, yeah, my abdomen is still, was still protruding. So she went like that, and it disappeared. Disappeared. And we were astounded. I mean, at that time, you don't believe there's a miracle. Believe me, you don't. You just say, well, what happened here? Something happened. How to explain this part? So later on that week, we had to go see the specialist, and then they do the testing. Just nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you. I don't know what happened. We can't explain it medically, but you're okay. This was the end of August. So, we got the good word. I said, okay, let's go see our grandson. <laughs> so, uh, I, so I made arrangements to fly from Freighton to Montreal, rather than to Las Vegas, because they live near Vegas, two hours south. I said, I think we'll go to Mexico City, and then California that way. So my wife got on the line and said, what do you mean Mexico City? We're going to go see my grand our grandson. I said, well, we have to go give gratitude to the Blessed Mother in Mexico City at the shrine for what you experienced. And then we'll go see our grandson. So that's what we did. And you know, it was a beautiful sight. And, uh, oh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be through here in a minute. But when we went up to Topeak Hill, which is where Juan Diego picked the flowers, and they have a beautiful church up there. We went in, and you know, you know where you have this sort of like, it used to be a communion rail, rail there. Well, we knelt there, and we both wept. We must have wept 15, 20 minutes. I thought somebody's going to come by and say, what's wrong with you two? But, <laughs> but it was the joy and the gratitude for what my wife had experienced, you know. So then we, we were there for, I think, almost a week when we were there. And we went to shrine quite a bit. And... Uh, and we even went to the, where the uncle received the miracle. We went to see that place where he was. And um, yeah, it was quite a thing for both of us. So, so we're both very dedicated to Our Lady Guadalupe. And I thank Father D Bishop Duck here for sure asking me to come tonight and just share this with you, especially on the, her feast day and also on the National Day of Prayer in Solidarity with Indigenous Peoples because that was the day dedicated by the bishops today. And just one postscript. Uh, in uh, February 2016, like I remember Knights of Columbus, we had a major meeting in Mexico City. Beth couldn't be with me because our oldest son was seriously ill. So I went, and then when we were there, uh, Monsignor Chavez, who was the, yes, was the uh, one who uh, was responsible for getting information for the canonization of Juan Diego, he, uh, he asked us, tonight you're going to see the actual image. And the, actu the image of Our Lady Guadalupe is sort of like, a, it, it's on a hinge. It's uh, like this, if this were the image, out to the public in the basilica. At night, it goes like this and brought it, stored in a very secure spot. So at night, we were taken up there to see the actual image. And I got a chance, let's just say if this were an image, I was... I was able to touch where that flower is because that's where Jesus was. And it's glass to protect it, but wow. And again, I got very emotional. After that, I tried to call my wife on cell phone. What are you talking about? I couldn't even make up what I was saying. I said, well, uh, you'll never believe what happened. So, you know, she's been such an important part of my own life. And I know out there a lot of people don't know. 
And so that's what I do, share. That's why I call myself Chauffeur of Lady Guadalupe. Amen. So I'll stop. See if you have any questions or if any want to take a short break before you have any questions or comments. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much, Bishop Doug. So, oh. Oh. so. Thank you very much. He's a wonderful storyteller. Uh, so take a few minutes just to talk at your table and uh, your experience, comments, uh, thoughts, uh, questions perhaps, and then we'll all come together. It's five minutes, five minutes, six minutes, uh, share at the tables. And then we'll see what happens, what comes from that. That's good. That's a very beautiful story. It is. It's amazing. And I, if there's any questions, there's a lot of experiences with the image I've had over time, too. That stuff comes Beautiful, beautiful sharing. Thank you very much. I love it. You know, one time, I was hoping for this. I go right across Canada. But it never happened. Anyway, so maybe it's happened. Maybe it's happened. Maybe we don't know what, what they're catching on. Oh, that's right. Live stream. People might be saying, oh, it's good. But yeah, but it was amazing. It was <laughs> yes, I hope you didn't mind. I, <coughs> no, thank I you. Thought you, were, you, were, you, were, you know, you were trying to make your mouth water more. And, uh, yeah. Okay, what I'll do is <coughs> but another, another compact to these cards I'll leave behind for you. Good. And people may say, well, can we get a card? Uh, yeah. Beautiful. <coughs> But it's like uh, my wife and I we just couldn't believe what happened. Wow. Yeah. Uh, listen to what comments and thoughts me. You might feel bad. Don't reach out. Yeah, no, I, I've been there actually. You know, you, used to, you stand on this thing oh, and then you go yeah. across. They want to they yeah. want to short I think I went about three times. Okay. We and then we went up to the hill. Oh yes, with the big hill. Beautiful tree. Oh, it is beautiful. Yeah. The whole thing is just... Uh, but the fact that you were able to touch it... Well, with the glass. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But even that you were that close. Yeah. You couldn't touch it. In a, when I was there, it was way oh, up there. Oh yeah. It's only a few you And of course, we were good friends to Monsignor Chavez. Mm -hmm. He was a foster writer. So. And we shared the story one time about Beth and I. No, he was very good. In fact, we're going back again this night in February of this 2023. <coughs> go back to the shrine. So that'll be much less than there. And this time, Beth will be there with me. Uh, yeah. I think we're down there with the February. Yeah, is that right? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to Rome in February. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, is this one of your. Yes, 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 yes. I just found out today. Okay. So we did my couple. Yeah, well, there's, there's more here than I can just have. Yes, there is. It's very nice. It's very, very close. You, you never have. You never know. You never know what kind of response you're going to get. This is a good response. And this is a great setting. I know, but just, it is. Just a good setting. Good lighting, and it's warm. Yeah. I mean, people are cruised together when you're in a pew, you really can't. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Hard to talk to church. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah. And if you go upstairs, it's cool. <coughs> yeah. It's cool. Yeah, we were drinking ice water when we were up there. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been a fantastic trip for me. And then tomorrow, of course, I'm going to. I think she said they were board members or something. Yes, 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 yes. And well, it won't only be board members. It's all, all it's people who are working for the board. Oh, okay. You'll, 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 you'll get, you'll probably get board members, but, but you get people who are uh, the board level. You know, the higher levels of the, of the school board, the superintendents, the director of education, probably the superintendent. This is a board that is troubled. That, uh, elected members of the board, you know, there are some Catholics who are more Catholic than the board, and some Catholics who are less Catholic than the board. 
also your DNA mixture. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> well, it's going to be interesting to keep back and get in front of the person that people here so, uh, of what they heard. Sometimes they don't want to express it. this kind of setting for help and don't you around. But they're fussing. So those are four priests from the time of Jesus. Oh, two more years. A bishop and a priest. Oh, which one is the bishop? Which one is the bishop? The bishop straight ahead. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm glad that guy knew the technology. Yes. That was a few minutes. Yeah, he was good. Yeah, I like that. He really, he really I would have to ask him, show me how he does, how he does yeah. that. Yeah. There's, a, there's a thing that is a magnifying glass here. <laughs> Broadcasting. So, just call you back to attention. <laughs> so it's just a, an opportunity to hear if you have questions, if you have thoughts, uh, you know, things that have that struck you about the conversation, the the talk, the presentation. Uh, so just a general sharing now, if you have any ideas or thoughts or questions that you would like to share. Silence. <laughs> Father Slayman, Monsignor. Are the indigenous people of Canada generally particularly devoted to Well, once they've heard it from me, they are. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll just give you an example. Uh, maybe I shared it already. I shared it about my experience with the residential school survivors. Did I share that tonight? I didn't? Okay. Anyway, in 2008, did I share that story? About how I was going around about Our Lady Guadalupe? And the residential school survivors were meeting in Member 2 First Nation, which is a Mi'kmaq community in Cape Breton. So my friend who was gone to residential school uh, said, Graydon, can you come and speak about Our Lady Guadalupe to the survivors? Because I had the image that time, and I was going around making a maritime tour. And it uh, was one good way to get out of the court. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, 10 days, I'm going to go around talking about Our Lady Guadalupe to uh, indigenous, non-indigenous communities. So I went to the St. Dan's Church, Catholic Church, and member to First Nation. And uh, I said, ask, the, ask them if they would like to hear the story. 
And she did. The answer was no. We don't want to hear anything about the Catholic Church. You know, especially from Green trying to tell us. <laughs> they know me too well. But, but I said, well, that's okay. I accept that. So after Mass on a Saturday night, Mass is at 5, 6 o'clock, I set up the image and I gave an explanation to people that were there. <clears throat> about 45 minutes and then Q&A and then they left. And my cousins who were in the back of the church, they were residential school survivors, all four of them. And they, after everybody kind of left and I was going to get ready to take the image down, they came up and they had, uh, they were crying. And I said, geez, I'm sorry, what is it I said that would have offended you, you know that? I, and if I did, please accept my apology because that was not the intent. They said, no, we're not crying for that reason. We're crying because of what you told us. They said, why did not the nuns tell us about Our Lady Guadalupe? And that she appeared as an indigenous woman, spoke an indigenous language, and she was so important. So I said, well, because the residential school in Shubi was all for the Maritimes, run by the Sisters of Charity in the Archdiocese of Halifax. I said, well, I don't know. I can't explain that. I only heard the story myself in 2006, and now I go around speaking about it. And anyway, they were glad. They even said a prayer themselves, and I was praying with them. The following summer, when they met again, they said, this time, they said, we want you to come to talk to all the survivors about Our Lady Guadalupe. So this happened for two more summers because they could see then the positive and the blessed thing that Jesus did by sending his mother to help indigenous people. So that, they were really good converts, if I can use that phrase. But any time, and I've gone to many indigenous communities in the Maritimes, I've gone to Manitoulin Island, I've gone to um, Ganawaki in Montreal, and uh, in, well, they call it Huron Village, one dot village north of uh, Quebec City, and then I've gone to I've gone to as many Mi'kmaq communities. We'll stick with. I mean, I go all over. Wherever I've got it, I'm invited to many places: Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, New Brunswick. So as soon as people hear the story, indigenous or not, the incredible things happen in their lives. You know, like they can't believe that this happened. So yes, that once I hear it. And they'll say, wow, isn't that something? So I hope that answers your question. I know I was confiding with Bishop Doug. I said at one time, I was hoping to go right across Canada with that missionary image, where um, once I was retired. <laughs> but that hasn't happened yet, I guess. So, but that's still part of my mission. I'd like to do is go right across Canada and speak about her. The Lord willing, if I got good health, I'd like to do it, but yeah. Thank you for that question. Thank you for the question, Monsignor Slavin. Other comments or questions or? Yes. I wouldn't know the, I didn't even know that figure, I, yeah. but, uh, well, part of the thing for our, even the ones that don't go to church now, and there's a lot of churches like that, but um, our, our children are being baptized, and, and when, at, close to after birth, there's lost, still a lot of baptisms that they can place, however, we want, <laughs> we want to get them into our churches, right? But so that's been a struggle. Uh, and there are indigenous population in terms of other groups in society, they're the largest growing population in Canada. And so a majority of them are Catholic, in, 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 it's, but it's making available in our communities priests 
who would come and accept our way of praying. Like, so that's, that's always this, this afternoon I talked about enculturation. But uh, I think more would. And, uh, but I think actually the indigenous population in Canada, I think, is now would be close to two and a half million. Yeah. And spirituality, yeah. Which I found really well, it is, you know, and that's why it's enculturation. I'll tell you, if you ever want to read a nice book, I'll give you homework, but there's a book that was written by a Nobelite who was teaching at St. Paul's University. It's called Christ is Native American. It's available on, I can get it from what they call it, Indico, where it is. Maybe Amazon, I don't know, but in there, because in 1984, when Pope, well, St. John Paul II came to Midland, he said, Christ in his own body is Indian. So I knew that from early evangelization, but so he, this, this theologian wrote a book, and he compares indigenous spirituality in the United States and Canada within our Catholic faith. It's a beautiful book, but it's not a million dollar seller. <laughs> But thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Somebody else over here had their hand up. Oh, yes. I just wanted to uh, share with you a little bit. My husband uh, here beside me is a deacon, and we served in uh, northern Saskatchewan. Oh, good. And we did uh, special services on December 12th. And heavy, but just to say that the, the depth of spirituality and the commitment to our lady and their knowledge of our lady it was enormous. And yeah. we had one of the uh, icons, mm -hmm. and we took it with us in the back of our pickup truck, all wrapped in a beautiful box. So we took it up there, and they were thrilled. We did a, a, a drive through the whole community, through the snow, minus 40, and people came out of their homes right. and prayed. Like they, they knelt down in the snow and blessed themselves as the truck went by. It was like their, their understanding of our lady. Yeah. Very, very real, very, very, very strong. Just, uh, well, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And, and that's fairly recent, like in yeah. the last 10 years. Then. Oh, good. We, we remember well your visit to Prince Albert. Oh, yes. oh yeah, you were there, Prince Albert, with Bishop Brian. Yeah. That time, oh, you were there? Okay. Jesus was cold that day I was there. <laughs> Holy mercy. <laughs> it was about minus 35. That, that's... Well, my wife was sick at the time, right? We had just come back from Arizona where it was, what, 85 degrees? And we hit Prince Albert, holy mercy. We said, oh, cool. <laughs> but I'm glad you were there. I'm glad I met you there. Yeah, Bishop Brian is in Toronto now, right? Uh, Bishop Albert Thebano. Oh, yeah, Thebano, but also Bishop Ryan Breda was also, yeah. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks, okay. Keep up your missionary work. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, if not, that's okay. It's, you know, you can sit with this. And uh, I told Bishop Doug I'll leave some of these prayer cards behind for him, just in case some, this is supposed to be live streamed, I think they said. So there might be somebody out there who couldn't be here tonight, but like to have a copy of the card. So, and I've always, um, I got more back than what I, invested in this. And, the, and, the, the, and you'll see in the back of that card, you'll see the silhouette of an eagle. You look in the back. My original cards did not have that. I had small cards. But I decided to get them like this because some of the others said, could you make them in larger print? <laughs> I said, okay, I will. But the other one, I had original one. When I, when I made 400 of those back then, like in 2006. I, I still got a few like that, but uh, yeah. So, share them with your friends, you know. If you need extra ones, Beautiful. Bishop Doug's going to have them, so. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, he has many titles, uh, Chief, Justice, <laughs> uh, Your Excellency. That's a nice one, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> your Honor. Yeah. But uh, tonight we can call him Brother, and thank you very much for sharing from your heart and sharing your faith with us. It's, uh, it, it was a profound... Uh, 
profound event and a pr profound moment in our lives, and uh, and we've all learned something. And uh, you're a very good preacher. I don't know. <laughs> we might have to do something about that. <laughs> But uh, thank you for coming to the Diocese of Hamilton, and thank you for sharing this evening. God bless you.